in the room. Now, I know it's been a long time maybe since you've done show and tell. Um, did y'all have to do that when you were little kids in school? Did you have show and tell days? That's too yeah. long ago, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Too long ago. <laughs> they probably cut that out because um, there's no telling what someone would bring to school these days if it was show and tell. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I, I asked us to do this for a purpose today, and um, it's probably pretty clear because it was in the study guide notes, but I am curious. Do you have something with you or something you can tell us about um, that you have made with your hands We'll count you, tell us about it as you're showing it to us, okay? So um, I'm just going to go around and ask if you have something with you. If you don't, that's okay. But if you do, I want to know. So Kathy Robinson, what do you have? I see something in your hand. I have a clay bowl that I went to Lynn Barnhart Studio and made and got lessons. I've never spun anything on a pottery wheel before. How about that? So this was my – and I actually – doesn't look terrible. <laughs> it looks fantastic. Very nice. Very nice. Miss Frances, do you have something? Frances Charlton? I have an Afghan that I did a long time ago. Oh my gracious. I didn't I didn't get it very big and had the dog uses it. <laughs> it's got That's a well kept dog. <laughs> that is very nice. Margie, how about you? Yeah, I made an arrangement to go on my kitchen table. Did you? Yeah. Really? It's not it's not professional, but it, it looks pretty good. It looks beautiful. <laughs> that looks really nice. I'm not very artistic. But I, <laughs> I like I like artistic people. They yeah. they yeah, they <laughs> stimulate me every now and then to get Yeah, I'm impressed by anyway. artistic people. That's right. <laughs> Well, that looks very nice. Thank you. Vincent Priscilla, what you what are you going to show us? Well, I, I have a basket. You I made did. that? Yes, I did. Several years ago. But wow. I was going to save this until we got to chapter 24 because the name of this basket is a Jeremiah basket. Is it really? It is. Wow. Well, I can't wait until we get to chapter 24 to see what that's about. And I, I, I tried to research the name, but I, I feel sure probably someone took it from that reading that chapter, probably. How about that? Most likely. Why, why else? Unless they had a child named Jeremiah. <laughs> right. That's great. That's what, I'm going I'm to have to cheat and go look at that and see what it says about your basket. <laughs> Vince, Vince has something. He's got to take this into the dining room, though. And okay. See. Well, we can uh, go on a field trip. I'll do it. <laughs> All right. Can you, can you see this? Am I holding see, it right? I see you right now. Oh, you see me up? Oh, better turn it around now. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that piece of furniture? That's a, that's that's a piece a of pie, furniture. That's a pie safe. What? So Priscilla, did the, Priscilla did the punch tin work on it by hand. Took a nail and a pattern and punched it out. And I built it and there's not a nail in it. It's all wood pegged together. No way. Wow. So I, I did that and that was a lot of years ago. Also, this china hutch. What? I did that also. Goodness wow. gracious. So uh, I enjoyed woodworking back in the uh, 80s and the 90s. And, and uh, now I enjoy gardening. Wow. What does that sticker on it say where it said made by Ikea? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, what I did is... Uh, I bought that in Sweden on one of my business trips and I <laughs> packed it up in my bag and, and then brought it back and uh, put it back together. There you go. <laughs> no, that's, uh, I'm so sure. I, I did that with uh, in a shop class one time and it's, it's interesting. One of the classmates in there with me was Dan Emery. He was oh, doing how about that? How about that? I remember Mr. Dan. <laughs> Well, that looks like beautiful work that you've made, that you've done. 
I'm going to jump over to Brenda Fowler's house, and I don't know who all is there. I think everybody, the five are still there. Is there something there that any of you have made that you can show us? Probably got the <laughs> Brenda, I can go first. I got one thing. I'm like Margie. I don't do a whole lot with my hands, but yeah, I didn't find Oh, no. Let me help you. I got it. I got it. I do. That's really oh, that's nice. Beautiful. So, I mean, I didn't make the stuff, but I bought the stuff and arranged it. I like that it. That counts. You you made that. That's right. <laughs> and Phyllis has got something. Very nice. I, at first, it like you removing your whole Christmas tree, so I'm glad it was not that, but <laughs> that would count, though. Maybe you can see it. I made a beach bag. You made and that? I did. I did. Oh, no. Um, beach and put shells in it or whatever. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. I'm like, I'm like Margie. I'm, I'm, not much of, I'm not much of a crafty person. When I first came from Georgia, the girls at the office at lunchtime, they cross stitched. So everything when I learned how to cross stitch, I gave it away, so I don't have anything. But two years ago, Joyce and I went to Greensboro to a district WMU meeting. And we st uh, it was at First Baptist Church in Greensboro. Oh, I noticed this is, uh, 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 it was when painting, and I never did paint. So this was just kind of some sketching things. And the verse that I have on it is Jeremiah. It's a Jeremiah, 33.3, so, that's right. Call upon me and I will answer. In that so, How about that? That's very nice. Anybody else there at Brenda's house? You girls bring something? I do things with my hands, but I didn't bring anything. I slipped my mind. What's one oh. thing, Margaret, that you've made with your hands? Oh, well, I've got two great grandchildren, as most of you know, and they are going to get their own personal actors for Christmas. Oh, wonderful. Because, wonderful. I, I, I used to cross stitch a lot. You know, I had a cross yeah. stitch. How about that? Miss Francis, are you in there too, Miss Jurgen? I'm in here. What's something but you I made with your hands? Well, I used to make a lot. <laughs> and now I just rake. <laughs> 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 you make piles of leaves. <laughs> yeah, I don't do much with my hands anymore. But I used to love to. Okay. Miss well, Willie? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Francis, were you going, were you telling us more? No, I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Willie, you said you were making, you're going to make a, a Japanese fruit cake. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> with lemon, coconut. <laughs> sure. Hello. All right. Um, Catherine, if you can hear me, I, I muted you for a minute, but you'll have to unmute it, looks like, maybe. There you go. Miss Catherine, have you made something with your hands? I crochet. You did? You do? And I've made this Santa Claus, too, in ceramics. What? Oh. That is nice. You made that. We used to have a ceramic shop in Garner, but it's not there anymore. How about that? And you made that with your hands. That's fantastic. Joyce, you made anything? I know you have. Besides a mess, what have you made? Yeah, let me see if I can do it on the phone. Uh, it's kind of hard for you to see it. Lights wrong way. That's all right. Oh, I see that. That's a reindeer. <laughs> you see? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Very yeah. nice. Kind of hard to get it in the picture. Joyce, you have yeah. a whole yard full, don't you? Pardon? I said, you have a whole yard full of things you made, don't you? Yeah, they're going out today, I think. <laughs> it was too windy, too windy and wet to put them out a couple days ago, so I was going to try to do that later today. Is, is, was that made of wood? Yes, sir. How about that? This is the baby. 
The other ones were too big to bring inside. Good gracious, you made them life size. Yep, they're pretty. They're probably about three or four foot. Mm. Are they all white? Yeah, yeah, I did kind of a silhouette thing because I have a nativity scene, the yeah. manger, Mary and Joseph, and I did them so they'd all kind of go together. Okay, that's neat. I just know there's a, do a lot of deer hunters around, so I'm hoping they weren't looking like targets for them or anything. Well, actually, one of the hunters got a deer down the end of my street last week. Oh, my goodness. A real one. <laughs> and not with and his my, truck. And my, my neighbor said that he had seen a white deer in the neighborhood about 5 o'clock uh -oh. when he was going out to work. All right. Well, I hope your deer will be safe. They wasn't Mike Winfrey down there at the end of your road, was it? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and June, you got something to show us? Uh, my grandmother always made aprons. She always wore aprons. And I made her, she's, she's been dead a long time, but I made her an apron that I have kept. How neat. How <laughs> neat. You made that. I did. <laughs> How about that? Very nice. Mike? Well, I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, and I'm certainly not a craftsman, but I do woodworking, Ron. Yeah. And I've built several things. Our kitchen table I made. I got a bench seat out in our porch. Um, I made um, bunk beds for my uh, for a friend of my son's. You know, I, do, I do a lot of kind of stuff, so it's all too big to bring in the house. And so I just so I just have to show it to you. I mean, tell you about it. Well, we'll take your word for that. And um, you're an honest man too, so I believe you made everything you just said. <laughs> I did. Oh. I wouldn't lie to you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, the, what I brought was this right here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a it's a poem. And there's a reason I have this poem here, because back when I was in seminary, I met this lady. Her name was Sherry. And the uh, Lord brought her into my life, and I ended up wanting to ask her to marry me. But I was a poor, broke seminary student, and there's no way I could afford a diamond ring at that point. So I wrote a poem. And in that poem, I gave it to her. Uh, once, I, once I wrote it, I wrapped it, and I gave it to her in, in this cheap little dime store frame. And um, she opened it up, and she read it. And she said, oh, thank you. I, it's so sweet. And I said, well, wait a minute. You hadn't finished reading it. And you're not going to be able to see it on your screen, but if, if you take the first letter of each line going down, it says, will you marry me? Oh. And, and I said, read the first letter of each line going down. And it took her a second to understand what I was saying and she's like, oh, my goodness. And I kept waiting for her to answer the question. I still don't know if she's answered that question yet. <laughs> I honestly cannot think if she ever said yes, but she must have because we're married. So, um, but that's something I made with my hands by writing that. And about six months later, I was able to get her a little bitty, little bitty diamond um, just to make it official. So <laughs> that's something I made in my hands. But let me ask you a question in light of this. And I shared this in our, our study guide. How how ridiculous would it be? Y'all took a lot of pride in the things that you made and you really are. Um, I can see it, you know, with some of the things that are on the screen. You, there's a lot of talent here, but how ridiculous would it be if we took all the objects that we made, whether it was a, a pie or a cake or a furniture or the flowers, and we held them up to the screen and we just started worshiping those objects. It'd be crazy. It'd be utterly ridiculous for us to take something we've made with our hands and then we start to worship this thing and ask for this thing to bless us. If it was, uh, maybe it was a flower arrangement like Miss Margie had, uh, please bless my yard so my flowers will bloom for the next year. You know, or if it was a pie safe, please bless us so we have baked goods all year long. You know, it'd be crazy for us to do that. But in that craziness, that's exactly, well, not exactly, but that's very similar to what Ju the Judahites were doing. They were making idols with their own hands and worshiping them. And, and so as Jeremiah is preaching, uh, God's given Jeremiah a message that tells them of the foolishness of their worship of items that they have no power, they're dead, but also they made with their own hands. Um, there's only one that's worthy of our worship, and that's our creator. And there's no created thing that's ever worthy of our worship. And that's what we're going to look at today in um, Jeremiah 10. Actually, 
And in Jeremiah 10, there's kind of a two-fold message here. One of the parts of Jeremiah 10, one of the main messages of Jeremiah 10 is that there is a praise that um, belongs to God. There's praise, all of our praise belongs to the one true God. It doesn't, we, can, we can compliment each other on the pies and the, the things that we make with our hands, and it's good to do that. It's encouragement um, to do that. But we don't praise those things in the sense that we give them, we ascribe them value that belongs only to, to God, a value greater than ourselves, and it only belongs to God. Um, and then the second part of Jeremiah's mess, message is that he's weeping. So there's praise, but then the, the brunt of this passage in Jeremiah 10, he's weeping and lamenting um, the, the despair of Jeremiah, I mean, of, of Jerusalem and Judah, that they are not even um, cognizant of some of them because they're willfully closing their eyes to all that God's been trying to tell them. And they've abandoned God for false idols and false worship. Now, I want to I want to make a point here, and you already know this, um, that there can be an idol worship of something that's not uh, a physical item. An idol doesn't have to have uh, material to it. Idol, we can make idols out of anything. We can even make idols out of ourselves. When we put ourselves in the place of God on the throne of our lives, we say, I'm going to worship myself and my life is going to revolve around myself. And, um, and so today, when we read Jeremiah, I want you to hear Jeremiah's heart as he, as he proclaims to the people through tears and through the praise of the true God. He proclaims to the people of the, the despair, you know, the situation that they're in, that they're not even aware of and why they're even in that situation. And so if you've got your uh, Bible, I'm going to ask you to read with me. And we're going to read, actually, um, let me ask you this. I know our time may run out on this today because so I want to be mindful of the time. Um, but let me ask you before we read the first portion and the first 16 verses, if you had a chance to read Jer Jeremiah 10, 1 through 16, a question I had on the study guide was what observations and insights can you share from your reading? Is there something there you want to share with us before us um, reading it together? The thing that stuck out to me is the thing that I underlined was no one is like you, Lord. There's no one like you. That 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 is um Jeremiah echoes that <laughs> because that's actually when you go to the Ten Commandments, the, it is also emphasized there we're not to worship another God. There are no other gods. We're not to worship anyone. When you go to the Shema, it says the Lord our, our God is one. And so there is no one like God, is there? Thank you for sharing that. That's that's certainly a, a, a an insight that we never need to let go of. Anything else that you gain from that? Just that the customs of the people were worthless, no matter what it was. It, 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 there's, they were all worthless. Yeah. Yeah. They were putting a lot of value in their things that they did on a regular basis, their customs, and, and ascribing righteousness to themselves because of the customs that they had. We, we actually can do that today, too. We can say, well, I've, I've done this, so that makes me righteous, whatever this is. I can, I, whether it's attending church or I've given uh, somebody something that they needed, and so that's made me righteous. And, and yet, apart from Christ, those customs um, are not, they're good, but they're not, they're not good in the sense of adding righteousness to us. Um, well, let's hear what Jeremiah says here. Let's read with me in verse, start beginning in verse 1. Uh, he says here, Hear the word of the Lord, hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. We always need to remember when Jeremiah is preaching, um, it's God's message through Jeremiah. And so he's, it's God speaking through Jeremiah, give him the message to turn around and proclaim. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations. That's speaking of those Gentile nations. Learn not the way of the, of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. Um, does anybody know what, real quickly what that's speaking of? The signs of the heavens? Don't be dismayed at the signs of the heavens. Well, what could that be? They worship the idols. I mean, they worship signs of the heavens. 
you know, they yeah. associate it as being that something that God made. Yeah, and they would worship even even the um, the stars and, yeah. and as having influence and power over the the events of life. Um, Kathy, you were getting ready to say something. I said, was it astrology that they were? Actually, astrology was part of it. The Babylonians were uh, huge into the the astrological aspect. There's a difference between astrology and astronomy, right? And astrology says that the planets and the stars, the alignment of those things have power in our lives to influence us and who we are and how we live. That's what astrology says. And it's, it actually gives stars um, the, the ability that only belongs to God. It describes to the stars what really belongs to God. Um, but astronomy is a study of the universe. So I don't want to be confused about that because the universe is actually fascinating. Astronomy is when you look at the size and the scope and just the beauty that God has put in the universe, um, in the expanse of the universe. But they were they were not just saying, oh, that's beautiful. They were dismayed because if a comet ha came by or, you know, if something happened in the skies, they would describe it as having power and influence in their lives. And so Jeremiah is saying here, don't don't fall victim to, to that false worship, which is what it is. Astrology is a false worship. Um, astrology itself. There, there's um, signs of the zodiac. Um, this is actually used in astrology, but it's also used in astronomy. And these are just constellations. There's 12 constellations that are used as um, in the sky for those the, the zodiac. So um, that's not necessarily the, the fact that there's a constellation named Orion or Taurus or Aries. Um, that's that's not wrong in, until you ascribe that as having influence and power in your life, which is what astrology does. Um, and so the nations that he was speaking of were Gentile nations were worshiping false idols and also giving influence to uh, or allowing the stars to influence who they are. They were worshiping those. And then as someone pointed out, verse three, it says, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. Um, a, a tree from the forest is cut down. Here he starts to speak of idol worship. Look what he says. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an ax by the hands of the craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. He just described your Christmas tree, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, but well, we don't worship it. No, and that's the key. <laughs> there are some people that look at this passage and say, so we should never have a Christmas tree in our house. But, but this, this is, um, Jeremiah's not preaching against Christmas trees. That wasn't even a, a, a birth of a savior to celebrate yet, but he is talking about the worship of take a tree, cut it down, decorate it, and then worship this tree. And he's saying that there's a foolishness in this. Um, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak, for they have to be carried and they cannot walk. Don't be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. So that whole section is talking about the false worship that they are doing and the ridiculousness of the false worship. Later in this chapter, Jeremiah uses words that me and maybe you as a parent taught our kids never not to use, but he sure used them. God used them actually to proclaim this towards his people, which God is, is rightful in using these. And we'll talk that in just a minute. And it's a, it's the word stupid. And he's saying this about the, the, the people who worship idols he's saying they're being stupid but let's look at what this says about god verse six mm -hmm. there is none like you O lord you are great and your name is great in might who would not fear you O king of the nations for this is your due from among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like you there was not going to be a god anywhere else that was going to be found like the one true god because there was only one true god Look at verse eight. They're both stupid and foolish. The instruction of their idols is but wood. That's an interesting phrase right there. Can an idol give instruction? If you start hearing your Christmas tree talk to you and you want to fall down and worship it, that has become an idol. And I'd say, get that thing out of your house. An idol can't speak. An idol can't give instruction. Um, and so it's foolishness. So it's saying basically that the idol is, is the, any instruction you think you gain from an idol is as foolish as the, as the idol itself, as the wood itself. Verse 9, beaten silver is brought up from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. 
They are the work of the craftsman in the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple, and they are all the work of skilled men. He's saying, you can decorate this with the best of the materials all you want, is what he's saying. But it's still nothing but a, a created object. It is not a God. There's no way to decorate it enough to where it's going to become anything more than what it already is. And it's a tree that has metal on it and a tree that has purple on it and a tree that has things on it, but it's not alive. It's nothing else but just a tree. And in verse 10, he says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus you will say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. These false gods that you've made, they're not going to last. When the earth burns, they're going to burn. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding, stretched out the heavens. And by his understanding, excuse me, stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens. And he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He's speaking of the truth. He's speaking of the true God and the power that God has. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. He's saying, basically, he's what he's saying here. That sounds like a harsh thing. What he's saying here, here is, in comparison to the, the wisdom and the of, of the true God, that every man is without any wisdom. Every man essentially is without knowledge compared to the, the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols for his images are false and there's no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusions. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Not, not like the, excuse me, not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob. We'll talk about that in just a second. For he is the one who formed all things. And Israel is a tribe of his inheritance, and the Lord of hosts is his name. There is one true God. Um, and, and, and yet, if we try to give what only belongs to God and ascribe that to any other created thing, then we are being as one who is completely without knowledge or wisdom. And, and, and the word that, that Jeremiah used here, is, is stupid and foolishness. Um, if there's any doubt about the, the heart of God through the message of Jeremiah on false idols, if there's any doubt someone has about what God thinks about false idols, they've not read this passage, have they? Because <laughs> God basically says here, it is the most foolish thing in the world to worship an idol that you've created. Verse 16, portion of Jacob. What is that? Has somebody had a chance to take a look into that and see, see what that's speaking of? Portion of Jacob. Title for God. Yeah, how is that a title for God? Where did that come from? It is a title for God. That's what it means. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> that's okay. Anybody? Yeah, thank you. Portion of Jacob. it says and, and this there's other times that it's um that that term is used about god being a portion does that mean he's not the full amount it's just a portion <laughs> no what it means is what that means is that he is a, a pos, um not a physical thing but there he's a possession of jacob in other words you, you've heard of god saying you will be my people and I will be your God. That's what he speaks to us, even about heaven. He says, you know, I, I will be your God and you will be my people. Well, we belong to God in relationship to him. And guess what? He belongs to us. He's, I don't have power over God at all, but I, I can say, well, God is my God. He belongs to me. Now, I belong to him, but he belongs to me. He's my portion. Um, he, he is that which belongs to me now. I am possessed by his spirit and and and. He is possessed by my worship in the sense that he is the one I ascribe all that I am to. He is my God. I want to be careful because I don't want to make God sound like he's anything less. I can tell you that Sherry is my wife. She's not 
and, and, and as my, in that relationship, I have possession of her as my wife, not as a thing, but as, as, as an equal with me, because we are now one and she is my wife and I am her husband. Well, in the relationship with God, he is our God and we are his people. And so um, in Abraham, from Abraham on, God chose Abraham. Actually, did you know that Abraham was raised by idol worshipers? His father and his grandfather were idol worshipers. And God reached in and chose Abraham. And, and Abraham ended up um, being the true worship, a, a worshiper of the true God, excuse me. And, and God made Abraham and all of his descendants his people. And, um, and they were, they're the ones that rejected God. And God ended up sending Jesus Christ for the, the Jewish people and for all the Gentiles, which we are, we are Gentiles. And when we trust in Christ, we become his and he becomes ours. Let me read you real quick a passage out of Psalm 16. And this is David. I'm going to just read a few verses here. But I want you to hear David's thoughts as this possession um, of, of God being his portion. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. God is alone is worthy of our, our heart and our worship. That's what he says. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are, you, um, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Speaking of false worshipers, he says, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. But then here's the, the last verse I want to read from this. He says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. So, Right now, you and I both know people who know about Jesus, but don't know Jesus. They can speak as of the Lord as being God, but not their God. And at, some, at one point I was there and, you, you know, at one point you were there. If you, um, if you know Jesus now, there was a point that you may have known there was a Jesus and there was a God, but he was not your God. Jesus was not your Savior. <laughs> And possess that relationship with God. So when we see, when we read about being a portion of Jacob, that is a very personal thing is that he is not just the God. He is my God. Now I possess a relationship uh, with him now. Then we move in, in the next few verses, 17 to 22, it speaks of this coming judgment. And y'all, I know um, we've talked about the judgment that's getting ready to come to Jerusalem. Um, and this is interesting because when you read 17, you start to see it looks like it's speaking of um, Jeremiah, but he's also starting to uh, speak of Jerusalem. And here's Jerusalem that's a, a personified Jerusalem. And so it, it looks like he's talking about a person. He's really talking about the people group of Jerusalem and, and Judah. He, he looks ahead and, and, and laments the judgment that's coming. He sees this invasion that's going to happen. And it's a, the distress it would bring. So he tells his people, pack your bags. Look at verse 17. He says, gather up your bundle from the ground. O you who dwell under siege, for thus says the Lord, behold, I am slinging the inhabitants out the inhabitants of the land of this time. And I will bring distress on them that they may feel it. He, he's saying you're not going to be able to put your head in the sand and, until this calamity passes by. You are going to experience the full uh, wrath of, of God's judgment on Israel, and he is slinging its inhabitants. That's a, that's a very active verb. Um, he is slinging inhabitants out of the land at this time. They'll be hurled like a stone from a slingshot. And then he goes on, and this is where it gets personal. Look what he says. He says, woe is me because of my hurt. Verse 19, my wound is grievous. But I, but I said, truly, this is an affliction, and I must bear it. But my tent is destroyed and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me and they are not. And there was no one to spread my tent again or to set up my curtains. Who's he speaking of right there? Do you know? Sounds like at first it sounds like he's speaking of himself, but really he's, he's taking on the grief of someone else here. And he's taking on the grief of the people of, of Judah and actually the, the city of, Ju of Ju um, Jerusalem. Here Jerusalem is seen as a, a grieving parent 
whose family is shattered and destroyed. Woe is me because of my hurt. The wound, my wound is grievous. The worst heartache I think that a parent can experience is the pain of a child and the loss of a child. And here Jeremiah grieves um, empathetically with Jerusalem and Jerusalem's personified here as a grieving parent. The tent will be destroyed. It's talking about the city of Jerusalem. The, the tent is gonna be destroyed and the children will be scattered. Many of the, those will be killed. Jeremiah's grieving over the, the ruin of houses, uh, excuse me, the homes really and the families and the children being separated from parents and many of those being killed and all of them being scattered. But there's a role that a certain group of people have in this judgment that's coming. And he speaks to that in verse 21. Look what he says. A voice, oh, excuse me, 21. For the shepherds are stupid and do not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, they have not prospered and all their flock is scattered. A voice, a rumor, behold, it comes. A great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah a desolation, a lair of jackals. What role did the shepherds have? What's he speaking of there about shepherds? Are these the sheep keepers? Or he may be talking about somebody else. He's actually talking about somebody else. Any idea who he's talking about there? The people. And their leaders. The leaders, too. yeah. Yeah, he's speaking of their leaders. The shepherds. He says in there, they did not inquire of the Lord. They were, they were going about doing their duty. In fact, many of them closed their ears to the Lord and went about their religious duties. And when, they, when Jeremiah would preach the message of the coming destruction, they would say, no, 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 that's not going to happen. We're doing great and things are going to be great. We're actually going to be blessed. And so the way of the leaders was away from the Lord. They went that way. And unfortunately, when the leadership falls, people also fall. The leadership has influence. And for, for the Judahites, the leaders were the prophets and the priests and the kings. It was the political civil leaders of the kings too. But the prophets who tethered the people to a vision um, of God for a pure heart, they, they were straying. And Jeremiah was calling them out, the other prophets out on this. They were being false prophets. The priests who were mediate, mediators between the people and God, um, they were straying and not listening to God and going about their routines. And so they all, and the king, they, they, they were all going away from God. And there's a, an incredible responsibility they have in the direction of the people. And Jeremiah is saying, the blood of the people basically is on your hands as well, leaders, because you have strayed. And your flock will be scattered. If you go into Lamentations, which Jeremiah also wrote, here's what he says about the destruction of Jerusalem in Lamentations. This is Lamentations 4.13. He says, this was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in the midst of her, of Jerusalem, the blood of the righteousness, of the righteous. So he's saying, leaders, you have led your people to destruction in here. He's calling out, the, the false prophets and false priests. How do you think they, fit, they would feel about that? Terrible. <laughs> they were not happy at all. And we'll, in fact, um, at the end of this chapter, this is actually the end of the temple sermon that began in chapter 7. All of these messages in 7, 8, 9, and 10 are part of uh, Jeremiah's temple message. At the end of this, we find out that it's not that, not only were they displeased, but they... Um, they took Jerusalem, they, they put a, a, a death penalty on Jeremiah's head, basically. They wanted him executed, and they were angry at him. And um, God spared his life at this point, but the, the priests, they banished him from the temple. And they said, you're not coming back. You don't, don't come back here in the temple. Because this message that he's proclaiming the truth of God, they didn't want to hear this message. They didn't want to hear that they were leading their people astray. And so they banished him, end up banishing him from the temple. Um, the final three verses in Jeremiah 10, um, basically, are, you see Jeremiah pleading for the mercy of God. And he kind of gives a basis on which he's pleading for this mercy from. And so I'm going to ask you to look in here in this passage. And what, what basis do you see Jeremiah um, speaking God's mercy from? I know, O Lord, that the way of the man is not in himself. That it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but in justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Pour out your wrath on the nations that you know not, 
and on the peoples that, that call not on your name. For they have devoured Jacob. They have devoured him and consumed him and have laid waste, uh, laid waste his habitation. He's pleading for mercy here from God, but what, what grounds do you see in there that he's pleading for mercy from? What do you see? I think what he's doing is he's saying to God, go after the enemies that caused all of this, not, not your people. Yeah, he is saying that, isn't he? <laughs> We're your people. Go after the ones who are doing the damage here. The Babylonians are coming. That's the ones who you need to pour your wrath on. So he's seeking God's mercy based on, let's redirect your wrath to them. They're doing harm to your people. And is, there, is a, there is a truthfulness, actually, in that. The Babylonians are um, choosing to, to rebel against God and choosing to destroy others and, and choosing to destroy God's people. And this is interesting because the Babylonians are also being used by God to bring his wrath upon Judah. And when you stop and think about this, it kind of brings you back to the... <laughs> The, the seemingly perpetual conflict between God's sovereignty and the free will of man, right? And, and he's thinking, well, God used the Babylonians to bring his wrath, and yet the Babylonians had a choice. They had free will and are responsible for their actions, and they're seeking to, to harm God's people. And are, are both of these relevant? Yes, they are. Is God sovereign? Yes. Are people, are, are the Babylonians responsible for their actions? Yes. They are. And we could actually probably spend the rest of every Wednesday from now until the Lord comes back thinking about how, how do we understand God's sovereignty and free will um, and make that such a seamless thing that our minds can understand. And I don't know that my mind is capable of understanding. I don't think so, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop trying. But I do know this, that God is sovereign, that he is in control. And when I say God's sovereign, that means that when he chooses to use the Babylonians, to bring as an instrument of, of his wrath upon um, the, the Judahites here in the same way with the Syrians and Israel, then he, he, is, he is sovereign and he absolutely has control over that. But I also know that when, I, when the Babylonians sin, when the Syrians sin, when you sin and when I sin, we have full responsibility for our sin. And my sin deserves the judgment of God. And so both of those are, are true. And here, um, Jeremiah is appealing to God, please show mercy because your wrath needs to be on those who are destroying your people. And Jeremiah, there's, there's truth in that. And actually, did you know you, that the Babylonians are destroyed? They are held accountable for their actions against God's people. Um, and we're going to see that. If you want to cheat, um, feel free to cheat. I say cheat, not in a negative sense, but you can cheat and go look in Jeremiah 50, and 51, you'll see the end of the Babylonians um, in, in their, their wrath of God. For They face judgment for, um, for coming against God's people. What's your thoughts on that? I want to I hear. What, what are your thoughts on that? Help me. Rephrase the question. <laughs> I think you I think you summarized it, Ron. I think you did a real good job talking about free will and talking about uh, uh, what Jeremiah is saying here. I mean, we all have that free will. We all have choices. It's just like today in today's environment, accountability is uh, something that uh, that seems to be lacking in a lot of ways. Yeah, it does. It sure does. I think you also see, I'm sorry? I think you also will see here that, and throughout the Old Testament in particular, uh, that God uses the ungodly oftentimes to punish his people, the godly, when they stray and when they turn their back on him. But in the end, those that he uses end up being punished as well, and oftentimes much more severely. Mm -hmm. And he always has a remnant. Yep, exactly. Always has a remnant. Isaiah, we just finished that, and uh, the last lesson was about uh, God's love and 
concern and care for everybody that he provided uh, uh, an out for the remnant. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's everywhere, y'all. That's true. You'll, find, you'll even find Paul talking about it in the book of Romans. <laughs> God has it in the, I think it's chapter 10. Chapter 10. I think it's 10 or 11. Yeah. Yes, you're he right. does. And we, uh, all, you're right. And all through the Old Testament, you see God using the ungodly to bring his wrath to the godly. And judges it's over and over and over written and 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 yet he has his people who call out to him and uh, his remnant actually that's one one of the things in verse 24 that's another re- reason that jeremiah is appealing to god in verse 24 um at the end of that verse he says you know correct me O lord but in justice not in your anger lest you bring me to nothing he's he's speaking of judah here not just himself personally he's speaking of judah bringing judah to nothing bringing your people to nothing so he's saying you know don't don't you promised Abraham that he would be a lineage of, you know, have a lineage of people, even nations that would come from him that would not cease to exist. So please don't let them wipe the Babylonians wipe out your people because God, they'll bring us to nothing. And so did God answer that prayer? Yeah. Yeah, he did. And he does every time there, he will always have a remnant and he does here as well. The Babylonians will come and the Babylonians will destroy Jerusalem and destroy Judah, but there will be a remnant. And there was a remnant. You see in the book of Amos too, I think it's chapter four, where God pleading to Israel, he said this, and basically what he says is, I've sent all these calamities upon you because you did not respond to my love. (laughs) And now they're rejecting and they're they're mistaken where the calamities are coming from and they still turn from him. So oftentimes when we reject God's love, you know, he may reach out to us in a way that is painful. Yeah, that's right. And we just have to recognize that. <coughs> well, and you're, you're bringing up a really interesting point, an important point too, and that is the the love of God. Um, if And I'm going to close with this right here. Um, you know, our, on our own, our hearts are bent away from God. And it's our sinful hearts, our sinful nature. And if I've got, even now, y'all, our hearts are prone to idol worship. And it may not be physical things, but it can it'd be anything that I put in place of God that, that has my heart's affections um, over God. And, and so what, how do we get rid of idols? If, if, you know, when I start, I really want to encourage you to think about this before God. You know, are there idols in my life? Is there anything in my life that my heart has a greater affection for <clears throat> than you, God? And if so, help me. To, to destroy that idol, to get rid of it, uh, recognize it for what it is, and, and ascribe to you alone my worship and my praise. And it's this love of God that has to become the greater priority, the greatest priority in our lives. And, the, you know, we can say, well, I'll just get rid of all the idols in my life and on my human effort. And that, that may last for a moment. It may last for a season. But if my heart hasn't changed, then something else is going to take its place. And so the way that to get rid of idols is that my heart becomes um, not just infatuated, but my, Jesus becomes who my heart's affections are, my life's affections are. All of my priority, all my purpose needs to be in Christ. And I would say, saturate yourself with the presence of God in his word and his grace. Surround yourself with that which will spur you towards a deeper love for God. Because when I have this, when I recognize Jesus' love and I respond and I love Jesus, then these things that seek to take God's place in my life, their they're glitter diminishes because there's nothing greater than the light of Christ um, in my life. It's his glory. And so when that becomes my heart's affection, then these idols, um, they don't stand a chance. And so that's what I would encourage you uh, and all of us who know Jesus is that as worshipers, we always have to pursue a deeper love and affection for Jesus. And, and in doing so, then the idols, their, their influence diminishes. This, this to me, a reminder that, that I, I don't pray enough. One of the things that has stood out with me, one of my children in the last week or so said he was on a Bible study and this was pointed out to him about their prayer life. And it's, it's made me think if you were asked a question, suppose you just had in your life today 
I only want you to pray to, and thank God for yesterday. Wow. Would be bad off. <laughs> I would. <clears throat> yeah. Made me think a lot of that one comment. That's true. That's true. It's interesting. The Lord must be putting this on a lot of folks' heart because I know in our home last night, Alex, um, my daughter's fiance, who's our college um, leader here at this church, uh, he and I were having a conversation and he's been reading some books on prayer in seminary. And one of them is Ian Bounds. He was reading some, um, some of the things Ian Bounds was saying on prayer. And Ian Bounds was drawing a line. He said, if you're, if you're um, not praying three hours a day, I believe it was, he said, minimum, then you're not where you need to be in, in your walk with Christ. Three hours of prayer a day. And he would get up in the morning, early in the morning, the first three hours of his day, he'd, he'd spend time in prayer. I'm not going to draw that line for someone, uh, but I am going to say that I've never gotten to the point in my life where I say, man, I am just praying too much. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> never have. You know, I'm just spending too much time with Sherry. You know, I've never had gotten my point of relationship with her that, Man, I'm just spending too much time with Sherry. I need to back off a little bit. I, my love for the Lord, as it increases, increases. Um, then, you know, Scripture says pray without ceasing, doesn't it? <laughs> that, um, that's where we need to be, is that we, have, we love the Lord that much, that our life is a constant conversation with the Lord. And we do need to pull away and, and spend seasons of time in prayer alone. Um, but that's not going to happen. It needs to happen out of my love for the Lord and my obedience to him. Y'all, this, is, this has been a blessing. We will meet next week, uh, Lord willing, and we'll pick up in, in chapter 11 here. Thank you for your insights and also your show and tell. That was fascinating, but thank you for, as well for your insights. And um, I pray the Lord will continue to, to grow you in your walk with the Lord. So let me, let, me, um, let me pray for us and we'll be done. Father, I thank you for your love and your patience with us, Lord. Over and over as you sought to, to reach the people of Judah through your word, through your prophet, Father, um, and they continued to reject over and over to the point where destruction came, just as you told them it would. Father, please give us hearts to listen, ears to hear, Lord, and, and um, a heart of worship to respond to you in all that you are. And may our life, if there's anything in our lives, anything at all that seeks to be on the throne, that we put on the throne, that we've allowed to be on the throne of our lives, that belongs only to you, Lord, may you Help us to surrender that to you in conviction and ask for your forgiveness, God. Not and, and have a zero tolerance for sin and idols in our lives, Lord, that we would ascribe our worship completely to Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I love you guys. Thank y'all so much for being here today. I hope you have a blessed week. And we will see you again soon. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Sure. Thank you. Good to see you guys.